Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for taking a little time. Um, it's, uh, it's both a privilege and um, an awful lot of fun for me to um, at least see my colleague again. Um, in the terms of human connections and what's the most important to us, um, our loved ones, our family, uh, being able to go home safely and to have my friend, my colleague, my classmate, of 2006 and Gabby Giffords here and then now to stand proudly with an advocate that is making and has been making the irrefutable case that life cannot continue on with gun violence in America the way it's been. Any acceptance of the status quo <laughs> and again people are saying we've, we've scheduled this a while back to have with the congresswoman schedule with our leaders who are up here and we scheduled this a while back and people said oh it, you scheduled it around the the tragedy in Nashville no in America today any week you schedule will be a tragedy and that's the absolute horror of this again if you watched that little girl on the bus and you find yourself tweeting or giving texts about an inanimate object Rather than that little girl and those kids, you need to reevaluate the direction you're going. We've been having this damn conversation too long. And I think the one thing I would tell all of you around here, things are different in Minnesota this year, so we are going to move legislation to make our children safer. We are going to move legislation. As a teacher, a father, as governor, as a member of Congress, as a member of society, I refuse to believe this country is not good enough to do what other countries have done simultaneously protected their children while protecting their freedoms and the lawful right to have gun ownership. The right to do what you need to do or feel you can do, but do so in a manner that is respective of society that, is, uh, that also has rights. Every one of those children walked into that building with every one of their constitutional rights, and they certainly had their rights to go home safely at the end of the day. So if you're defending... This idea that, that there is supremacy around your right to have and carry and wield or whatever at any given part of the day has never been part of what this country is. I, as a lawful gun owner, someone who's done this my whole life, recognize that what we're proposing, whether it is making sure that there is a significant background checks that make sure we close some of these loopholes, or red flag legislation that all of us should want for our own relatives, knowing that a lot of these gun deaths are suicides in opportunities, and in even in the cases we hear early in many of these shootings, family members who knew and have a lawful court-ordered right that doesn't strip people of their rights, but recognizes that if someone is in a situation where they're a danger to themselves or others, we have a responsibility to help them. States across the country have done this, and when they have, and you'll hear from the folks up here, it's lowered, it's lowered the number of deaths. So I just have to say, um, you're going to hear from a lot of speakers today. I want to take some time at the end um, to reiterate around the incredible work that was done out in Raymond, Minnesota, in Candeoa County, and the folks in Prinsburg. Um, as you know, we had a train derailment, um, about 22 cars, 10 of them ethnol cars. Um, several of them punctured and caught on fire. Um, but the situation in the response, both the response from the railroad in Burlington, Northern Santa Fe, um, the sense of urgency they took it by having their CEO, Ms. Farmer, on the ground, um, and the experts that were out there along with over 20 agencies, including the state, and calls from the White House prior to 6 a.m. here um, in dealing with this, I think we're all understand. Public safety is a broad spectrum of things, public safety from rail cars to this, but this public safety issue can no longer be ignored. We responded with 20 agencies. We responded with an entire community. We got people out of their homes and kept them safe because rail cars were burning. Well, rail cars are burning in guns every day in our school. They're, they're, these situations are coming up every day across the country. Until we start responding with the same sense of urgency that we do to these disasters, because when we do it, pe kept people alive handled the situation, took responsibility. Oh, and guess what? We've done things to make these less lethal by changing the regulations around what those train cars look like. The same thing can be done with these firearms. So I, uh, I'm grateful. You're all here to hear from, uh, from Congresswoman Giffords and the work they've done, but we've got law enforcement up here. We've got legislators up here. We've got moms. We've got dads. We've got brothers. We've got sisters. We've got what the vast majority, pull it, 
poll these two issues. Nothing polls like this. Um, people get it. They, they know this is what we should do. Minnesota is going to move forward. We are going to do as we've done for the last few weeks, move things that people have asked for to improve people's lives that make a difference. And on these pieces of legislation, this is a start. And for those critics who say, you won't stop all of these. I don't care if we stop one, that's what we're after. This idea that we have to stop everyone or there's some magic solution that's going to get there, there aren't magic solutions, but there are solutions. They did it in Scotland. They've done it in other countries where they kept their freedoms, kept their rights to own firearms, and protected their children. That needs to come to Minnesota. With that, I'm going to turn it to... Uh, to my partner in this, someone who's been vocal about this, someone who, um, as we send our child off to, uh, to school every single day, um, has been asking us to do the simplest things. And these legislators are here. I cannot express my gratitude enough to the legislators that are here. The first lady, when we first came to office, asked a very simple thing. Hold a hearing about this. Let's see the data and let's try and improve this. For four years, those were rejected. You know what changed? Legislators changed. You said, we'll have the hearings. We'll go things forward. First lady. I'm going to use the step. <laughs> Good afternoon. It's nice to see you all. I met lots of these events, right? Lots of these moments um, with the governor and our team. And it's been really uh, an incredible session uh, so far. But rarely do I choose to speak. We have so many articulate people um, who make points and discuss policy in so many important ways. But today is different because I am speaking on an issue where I hope all of you and everyone who has a chance to watch speaks because we need every voice in the room, every voice in the state, every voice in every school hallway to make their voice known and heard on this issue. It is time for a change. The importance of taking action against gun violence cannot be understated. As a mother of a high schooler and a college student, I am heartbroken each time we learn of another mass shooting in a school or on a college campus. The other day I opened a package that came to our house from Amazon and I wondered who had ordered a package from Amazon and it happened to be our 16 year old son. And it's an orange shirt and it says, no more thoughts and prayers, let's take action and change policy. He wore that to school yesterday, and he asked if it was clean to wear again today. It, it wasn't. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't, but I said it will be tomorrow. When 16-year-old young men are wearing shirts, speaking out about this, it's a very strong statement. So I would encourage you to wear your shirt, to bring your voice, to stand with women as I have stood with moms who demand action. For four years, asking for a hearing and being told that was impossible. I know that not every single person agrees with every single piece of policy or legislation. But what I would say to our legislators, those brave legislators who stand with us today, and those who are off doing committee work and other things, at the end of our terms, there will be some things that will be really standing out in our mind and there will be others that will fade away. But as the governor and I have made decisions in our life and tried to model ourselves after people of courage, like Congresswoman Gabby Giffords, we have asked the question, at the end of the day, when there is an issue or a problem, have I done every single thing that I could? Every single thing within my power. Is that the decision I made? Is that what I did? So for members of the House and Senate, on this very issue, on this important issue, the question remains at the end of the day, have we done everything we could? Have we done every single thing we could to keep our children and our schools and one another safe? 
If that answer is yes, then there will be votes and there will be passage of this really important beginning for Minnesota, for our children, for reclaiming our dignity and our respect for life. So as I close, I would ask you, please join us. Please join us in this very common sense approach to this very significant issue this week, this day, this moment. And I'd like to introduce a champion um, on issues that are most important to children and families in our state, our Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan. Thank you so much, First Lady, and good afternoon, uh, everyone. I first want to just take a moment, of course, to thank uh, Gabby Giffords for being here, um, who has modeled what it means to be a legislative champion um, and an advocate uh, for gun violence prevention, and also our own champions uh, who are here with us today, uh, Representative Pinto, Representative Frazier, Senator Westlin, and my senator, uh, Senator Latz. Thank you for your leadership. I remember when my daughter came home in first grade and she said, Mom, Mom, we won the treats, we won the prize. And I said, for what? And she said, we were the most quiet when we did the drill. My soul left my body. And she has had multiple drills since that time. We cannot and we should not put this on the backs of our children. We need to bear responsibility for their safety. And on Monday, after I learned that six more innocent lives were taken by gun violence at an elementary school in Nashville, and when I saw that photo, that iconic photo of the little girl terrified and crying in the bus, I sat in my office and I cried. I cried for the parents who didn't know that they would be kissing their child goodbye for the last time. And going through that in my mind every morning, what drop-off looks like for our family. My heart broke for the families and loved ones who did not get to say goodbye. We have let senseless violence carry on for too long. And while we continue to carry the sadness and the grief of another horrific mass shooting, I still feel hopeful knowing that we can take action right now. Now, I am so grateful for the voice and the support of Gabby Giffords. Her resiliency and her courage, her advocacy for gun violence prevention is so powerful. In January, the governor and I rolled out a budget that places children and families at the center and ensures that everyone in Minnesota deserves to feel safe and protected and valued in their community. And let's be clear, gun violence impacts every community in Minnesota. We cannot let this be the reality for our children and families. By expanding background checks and introducing red flag laws to keep guns and weapons out of the hands of people who pose a known risk to themselves and others, we are increasing safety for every Minnesotan. And it is so far long overdue. We have to get it done. I look forward to working with the legislature to pass these bills to make Minnesota the best place for kids to grow up where they are safe and where they actually can grow up. These three nine-year-old children in Nashville were denied that opportunity. We cannot let that happen to anyone else in that state, in this state. So um, we have an incredible partner, uh, another partner in justice who's been working on these issues in his time in the Minnesota House and his time in Congress, and now is our Attorney General. Uh, Keith Ellison. Uh, le let me tell you that when, when uh, Tim Walls and, and I, us two Minnesota guys, went into the United States Congress in 2007, 
both of us fell in love right away with our, our friend Gabby Giffords. She was fierce, she was kind, she was smart, she read the bills. <laughs> and so I'll never forget when she became a victim of gun violence herself. I was at a high school wrestling match in southern Minnesota. And I bet you know where you were, Governor. Because she, she was precious to us, but we thought to, that, you know, wow, what a tragedy. What an unthinkable tragedy. But who, we didn't know then that only a few years later she would be the leading voice for gun violence prevention, prevention in America. Yeah. Nobody would blame Gabby Giffords for just worrying about her own health. But she's worried about the health of our whole society. So bless you and thank you, my friend. And thanks to all of your team, who I had the pleasure to meet yesterday and was so impressed with. You are leading the way for us. And I also want to just say that at the Attorney General's office, there's things we can do. We are using our civil authority to make sure that if you sell a gun, that you sell it legally. And if you don't, we're going to sue you. Uh, and I just put that on the record because I I'm a gun owner. And I think it's, it's, it is lawful to sell and buy and own guns, but you've got to obey the law when you do it, and you can't do it in a negligent way. Now, I just want to say as I wrap up, there's a part of this legislation, one of the bills, that I just want to draw attention to. After we saw a, a plethora of violence break out in, uh, in the Twin Cities, uh, a group of pastors went to a police officer, Inspector Charlie Adams, and they said to Inspector Adams, where are the hot spots in the neighborhood? And they called it 21 days of peace because there had been a lack of peace with guns. And Inspector Adams said, here, here, and here. And these pastors and their congregations, they went out to some of the most hottest spots in the neighborhood. The governor knows about this. And they sat out there with iPhones and lawn chairs and gospel music. And they literally reduce the violence in those very hot spots. This bill recognizes that there is absolutely, we need police, we need prosecutors, but we also need community. And supporting the community violence intervention is a very important part of this. So I want to thank you, Governor, and our legislators and everyone for recognizing that we will solve this problem through people power. And with that, I want to say, bless you, Gabby. And from one gun owner, gun owner to another, let me introduce you to Bob Mo 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 Mocus <laughs> of the uh, Giffords Gun Owners for Safety. Bob, take it away. Is, is this for you or me? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'd like to thank everybody for coming. As the original, one of the original founding members of uh, Minnesota Gun Owners for Safety, I can say with full certainty that the NRA does not speak, speak for all the gun owners. I live in Burnsville, Minnesota, and as a youth, I shot on a rifle team that was sponsored and instructed by uh, NRA instructors and sponsored by the NRA. I, sh I shot in many uh, NRA-sponsored events until I reached college age and went off to college. As an adult, I, was, uh, I had a job where I had the opportunity to be trained by retired federal air marshals to carry a gun in a cockpit. And so I did that. So here we are again. Another day, the flag is at half staff again. Every day in this country, at least 110 people are killed by the hand of a gun. That is four Sandy Hooks every single day individually. That flag should be at half mass every single day for these people because they go through the same pain and grief and suffering that these people in uh, Nashville did. My sister Diane was murdered 
and that was our Sandy Hook. No other advanced country in the world lives like this, and neither should we. I am a veteran and a gun owner, as I said, and I understand the rights granted by the Constitution come with, with a certain degree of responsibility. With respect to the Second Amendment, that means that I must learn about the gun and the risk it poses. It means to submit to a background check, and if need be, willingly give up my gun to authorities if it's deemed that my mental ca capacity has declined. The bill on background checks is supported, uh, the bill on background checks on all gun sales is supported by 92% of Minnesotans. The reports in the aftermath of Nashville shooting indicate that there were clear warning signs, but Tennessee, just as like here in Minnesota, do not have a policy to intervene. In many of the high profile shootings, as well as the large numbers of suicides by gun, the shooter was known to be in a crisis by family, friends, or others. Both background checks on all gun sales and extreme risk protection order laws have already prevented mass shootings and firearm suicides in red, blue, and purple states. They work. I mentioned that I was a survivor due to my sister being murdered. And I know that responsible gun ownership and common sense gun laws save lives. I would like to draw attention to the preamble of the Constitution. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. I also know what the Second Amendment says. But I also know that a well-regulated militia does not mean an unregulated armed populace. And those are the words that are in direct contradiction to the preamble of the United States. That preamble tells me that we should be free to go to malls and schools and churches and nightclubs and parks and so on and to feel safe from gun violence. But we can't. Every day we're burying kids in this, fam in this, this country. And that preamble of the Constitution is what set the framework for the Founding Fathers to write the rest of the Constitution. Now they need to interpret it that way. Today's the 89th day of the year, and we've had 130 mass shootings so far. These policy proposals that we have is not an infringement and is not an inconvenience on a gun owner to get a background check or comply with red flag laws. Okay. It, is, it is their patriotic duty, they're obligated, the patriotic duty to follow those laws. The real infringement and inconvenience was to the families of Sandy Hook, Uvalde, Orlando, Illa Vista, California, San Bernardino, Las Vegas, Texas, 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 and in Parkland, Florida. We can go on and on. That's where the real inconvenience is. And it's time to put the lives of our children first on this. Our children's lives should not be the price we pay for that Second Amendment. And as the governor mentioned, no one law is going to save every life. Seatbelts don't save every life in a car, but we, we did seatbelts. So we just got to one law at a time, and we'll, we'll get there. We're going to get there because people are finally becoming aware. So I'd like to close with a quote from uh, Supreme Court Justice Warren Berger in 1991. The gun lobby's interpretation of the Second Amendment is one of the greatest pieces of fraud, I repeat the word fraud, perpetrated on the American people by special interest groups I have ever seen in my lifetime. Thank you, Gabby.
supposed to be a list here. <laughs> the chief. That's all I know. <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, good afternoon. My name is uh, Chief Jay Henthorne from the Richfield Police Department. I'm here today uh, to represent the Minnesota Chiefs of Police Association. Uh, we, the association, uh, with many Minnesota support background checks legislation and extreme risk protection order legislation. Current law here in Minnesota has a loophole that allows handgun and semi-automatic military assault rifle sales at gun shows, private transactions, and online purchases to happen without a background check. While all other sales do require background checks, we strongly feel that requiring a background check on all sales and transfers will prevent at least some firearms from going to individuals who are not legally allowed to possess them. While we know this won't prevent all gun violence or gun deaths, we do think it will make a difference. Extreme risk protection orders focus on the relatively rare, but far too often, tragic circumstances where an individual's mental health issues escalate to dangerous behavior. These orders will allow law enforcement or family members to bring evidence to a judge to temporarily separate the person in crisis from firearms when there is substantial evidence that they pose a significant danger to themselves or others by possessing that firearm. Family members and law enforcement are often the first to see the warning signs and we believe the issuance of a temporary risk protection order is a sensible and reasonable option to address those potential dangerous situations. We have met with law enforcement officials from Florida, Illinois, Connecticut, and Virginia. We have found that extreme risk protection orders work. We've heard the examples. So again, as a Minnesota Chiefs of Police Association, we support this legislation. Uh, having an incident, a school-related shooting in my jurisdiction, and then nine or 10 months later having another shooting at a high school football event. Um, I just want to thank the governor uh, for reaching out to me that night and calling me and knowing that we had the resources to handle that situation uh, in a very tragic event. So thank you. I'd like, sorry. I'd like to introduce Ramsey County Attorney John Choi. Uh, thank you, Chief. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is John Choi, and I have the privilege of being able to serve as the uh, Ramsey County Attorney. And uh, in that role, and I'm also here today on behalf of the Minnesota County Attorneys Association, all 87 elected county attorneys, and our association. And we are uh, people of different perspectives, geography, uh, but for a long time, we have taken the position in favor of both of these bills, strong support for these bills. And again, we have di very diverse backgrounds. We see the world in different ways, but we know because oftentimes it's the prosecutor that has to end up picking up the pieces, having to have those difficult conversations with those that have been impacted by gun violence. And we know that a lot of these situations and these tragic things that happen in our uh, community they can be prevented. And there are more solutions than just showing up to a crime scene and prosecuting a case. And today, I feel like in Minnesota, with the great leadership that we have here, um, that we're on the verge of something really important and good. But we can't obviously take anything for granted. And I want to thank the legislators who have been working on this bill, because I think they have done everything. <laughs> They have done everything that they can to listen to all of the various perspectives and try to make this bill as reasonable as possible. But as the chief had mentioned, uh, we really believe that this, these bills can make a difference. It won't be the magic solution for, to end all gun violence, but it can make a difference. And as people have said before, the vast majority of Minnesotans support these re reasonable changes to our laws. So in closing, I get the great honor of um, introducing our, our, our guest keynote speaker. And I just want to say that um, uh, on behalf of just many of us here in Minnesota, we are just so grateful for your leadership and how you have uh, really created a movement. And we had a movement, but you made it so much stronger. And we're so lucky to have you here in the state of Minnesota to give us a lift. So thank you for being here.
Our lives can change so quickly. Mine did when I was shot. But I never gave up hope. I chose to make a new start. To move ahead, to not look back. I'm relearning so many things, how to walk, how to talk, and I'm fighting to make the country safer. It can be so difficult. Losses hurt. Sets back are hard, but I tell myself, move ahead. I'm finding joy in small things, riding my bike, playing the French horn, going to the gym, laughing with friends. The small things add up. We are living challenging time, but we are up for the challenge. My own recovery has taken years. Many, many people have helped me along the way, and I learned so much. I learned when people care for each other and work together, progress is possible, the world is possible, but change doesn't happen over in it, and we can't do it alone. Join me, let's move ahead together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gabby. Uh, the Attorney General was right. We went into a class, I think there were 65 of us back in 07. And uh, I think everybody who goes into Congress is in awe. And uh, I can tell you in that class, I, I think it was kind of a consensus we came upon very quickly about Gabby Giffords. I remember the talk we had on this is we thought she would be the one who would be president out of that class. Um, and I still believe that. I, I said, I think the the interesting thing about life is in, in this tragedy, um, she's more effective than presidents now, and um, she's taken her talent. And I, I think about this for all of you. Keith is right. I can remember exactly where I was. That class, there were a few of us, Keith remembers this. Gabby was really adamant about reaching out to her constituents. We had a very, she and I had a very similar situation. We came from more rural districts um, that maybe leaned a little more conservative, but we talked about these issues. and. Gabby said, we just need to make ourselves as available as possible. And it was her idea, and I was one of the ones that joined with her, the Congress on the Corner. Yeah. And we would do our Saturday meet and greets in the produce aisle of the local supermarket. And I'll tell you what, you hear how people talk. You get to see people. Oh, you're here. I'm madder than heck about this or this or this. That's what Gabby was doing on that Saturday morning 12 years ago. And I think they don't get forgotten this. She had a nine-year-old constituent whose goal was to come and see her congresswoman, this strong, passionate leader that was making national attention with her voice. That little girl was shot and killed. Gabby Staffer, like these young staffers who work in my office, was there supporting the congresswoman. Gabe died in those shootings. Those are the aftermaths of this. And as Bob said, his Sandy Hook with his beloved sister. So I... I we all know this. We've all been through it. There's a cynicism that's, that's rampant right now in our country anyway with things. But this is one that the folks know. People that have the audacity to, again, send out very inauthentic, oh, we're sorry this happened again, without trying to fix it. We have an obligation to do that. And I know this is a holistic approach. And I just want to name on this issue, too, is as we deal with mental health issues, how dare you blame this on people who are dealing with mental health issues? The number of people, Minnesotans ourselves, all that go through these things, the vast majority of people, that's not it. Say what we know is in this, that other countries deal with mental health issues. Other countries deal with poverty issues. Other countries deal with these things. You know what's different? Hundreds of millions of guns and easy access. That's what's different. So I can't stress enough, and as Bob said, none of these things stop you from owning your firearms. None of these things. You see those pictures of that shooter stalking through the halls with that firearm. Um, it's unacceptable. So I, I just want to give my great gratitude to the folks who are here. I don't know what to say. I, certainly in the job as governor you would do this. But I think even in the job as high school teacher, 
the number of people I know who've had their relatives shot and killed, each one of your families, I know there's families up here that their children witnessed shootings. All of us have now. That is not normal. So I'm just right on this right now. No one is challenging. No one wants to take your guns. This is not some debate or some thing that was thought up by media experts and, and say, talk about it this way, say it this way, and that's what we'll get. That's not what it is. I'll tell you what people want. They want their kids to come home safely. They want to be in those malls and in those parks and in those nightclubs. And they can still do the things they need to do with legal firearms. So, again, we're going to pass this. It's different. For those who say no, um, I just say look at what these legislatures have already done to improve the lives of Minnesotans, and they're going to continue to do that. So um, thank you all for here. I'd be glad to take any questions of the folks up here who would like to. Yeah, I'll let I'll let senators come and speak on this. That, um, but I have to tell you, if if passed as prologue, the answer is yes, because we're simply getting things done. And I think the passion on this one. So I'd let if the Senate senator want to speak on it, Senator Latz, he knows this. But they have been leading with courage, um, with vision. So, thanks, thanks, thanks. Boy, it didn't take long for that question to come up, did it? Um, those of you who have been following this uh, know that for almost the entire tenure of my predecessor in the judiciary, at the conclusion of most of our committee meetings, I would ask when we were going to have hearings on these gun bills. And I kept getting different stories. Uh, we're pretty crowded on our agenda. We don't have time for it. Uh, leadership isn't making it a priority. Um, at the end of the day, there were hundreds of hours of unused committee time that we didn't use for anything. We had plenty of time. But it's true, it wasn't a priority. Uh, it's a priority now. Yeah. Yeah. And we've had hearings in the Senate. And we passed the bills out of the Judiciary Committee. Uh, we have 34 members of the Senate. Some of them are new. Some of them are getting their feet under themselves, learning what it's like to be an elected official. And uh, they're learning what it's like to make tough decisions. Uh, for some, they look at their districts, and these are not necessarily easy decisions for them. Uh, I'm cautiously optimistic that we're going to get to 34 on this. And we're going to keep working until we do. And so with the help of the folks behind me, all of the grassroots that are working with them, with the help of the governor and the first lady and the lieutenant governor, Attorney General Olson, County Attorney Choi, the uh, law enforcement organizations that support these, and probably most importantly, the people of Minnesota that support these. Because if you look in every district in Minnesota, in every legislative district, a strong majority of the people that live there support both of these bills. And when their voices are heard, recognized, understood, it will be an easier decision for every member of the legislature. But we're going to get there, so stick around. Thank you. Uh, for me, and I think I can reflect the views of, of the people who have been working on these issues for many years, um, the two bills that we're seeking to advance, the red flag bill and the background check bill, have the most data behind them that say they work to reduce gun violence and, and gun deaths. Uh, they have the broadest identifiable support in the population in Minnesota. 
And uh, frankly, I don't think we want to be in a position of biting off more than we can chew either. I think it's worth focusing on two effective pieces of legislation and not spreading our, well, you can't avoid uh, gun metaphors in the English language, can you? It's, it's, we don't want to spread our fire too wide, right? So let's concentrate on what we think will be most effective, and I think that that's what we've been doing. That's what we've tried to do for a number of years. And there may, uh, you know, let's work on those. And I would make the case good legislation and where the public wants you. We'll be back with majorities for some years. We'll continue working. So that's, um, that's my prediction on this. When you work for Minnesota and you get the work done, they'll start to see this. So I appreciate that. Anyone? Yeah, I don't, I, this one, I, well, I'll tell you first and foremost, I certainly don't support arming teachers in any way, and I think we've seen proven this. More guns don't mean better safety always. I, I, I want to be clear about this. Listening to the professionals who are in this, understanding individual situations of where things are at, but as a fix on this, we always talked about this. It's a military term to harden the perimeter. We don't need to harden the perimeter to our schools. We need to make sure that guns aren't in our schools and that the shooters are not there. I think that's the way I want to approach it. I do want to be clear, though, we listen to local officials depending on where situations are, but I never think it's a good solution. And I think, again, we are, we are rewiring our children's brains with active shooter drills. We're rewiring their brain of what that safe place is. And for many of our children, that's the safest, the best place they can be. There's other things that we can do. We got to go further upstream. Take any off topic or? We'll take some off. If these folks go, I'll stay for some off topic if you need it. Thank you all. Thank you.